Great. Um, so I'm Andrew, and uh, I help to lead the team here at Trinity. And it's really good to add my welcome to, to Holly's, especially if you're new or visiting. So you turn to your neighbour. Can you think of a film that starts at the end of the story? Okay, you've got two minutes. To, I said, yeah, it wasn't rhetorical. Turn to your neighbour. Can you think of a film? Effectively starts at the end. Okay, there we go. That's enough fun for one night. Not having any more of that. Too much. Uh, shout out, any films that start at the end? My hero, I'm old. I can't. Pardon? Heart of the Sea. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Heart of the Sea. That's the one with the whale. Moby Dick. Yeah. Yeah, that is the one with the whale. Yeah, yeah. Great, good. Uh, uh, sorry, Gladiator. Gladiator. You looked at me and you thought a Gladiator. Yeah, I can. I get. I kind of get that. Okay. Yeah. Any others? Uh, pardon? Inception. Inception. Rubbish film. Rubbish film. Five Wife made me watch it. Sorry. Five, five something. <laughs> I'm. Listen. I'm deaf and blind. Oh, Titanic. That's the one with the whale. No, that's the one where the ship. There's no point. There is no point in going to watch Titanic. You know what's going to happen. It's my top 10 least favorite films to, to, to watch. OK, hey, here's my favorite for this. Start, film starts at the end, Forrest Gump. Yeah. So if you haven't seen Forrest Gump, anyone not seen Forrest Gump? One or two people have not seen Forrest Gump. Yeah, you need to see it. So basically, Forrest Gump, beginning of the film, bus stop, sits on a bench, and starts to tell his story uh, as to how he's got onto this bench um, and what's going to, you know, the, the where he hopes to be. And he does it through, through a whole series of, of flashbacks. And, and it's a really powerful, powerful way of trying to draw people into a story. And I wonder if you realize that that's maybe one way of thinking about Mark's gospel. Ah, oh, got silent now. I, I'd like to suggest to you, it's not an original Andrew Blythe thought, but it's one that I, I go with, that in a way, Mark's gospel kind of starts with the end and then does a whole series of flashbacks. Now, some of us have been on this journey for a, a few weeks now. We've been going, walking with Mark. We've been following the life of Jesus through the whole of Mark's gospel. And we've noticed, we've already appreciated that Mark is the shortest of the gospels, probably the first that was written. So it's very, very likely, um, if you'd like to think and look more into this, there's some amazing books and some amazing things you could do. Very likely that the followers of Jesus followed rabbinic practice, the practice of the rabbis, and had in their hands really early on sayings of Jesus, collected sayings of Jesus. So they're in a, a, an oral tradition. They're really good at passing on stories. They're not like us, Chinese whispers. The stories change as you go on. They're, they're used to telling stories accurately and passing them on. But they also have collected sayings of Jesus in their hands. Really quickly, really soon after Jesus was, was doing these things. But then at some point, someone says, we, we need to put that together. Someone says, we, we need to know the, the details because, um, you know, Mary, you always tell us, don't you, about that time when. And, and, and Peter, I mean, you were on the mountain with him and, and lots of us weren't. I mean, you've told us all about it when you went onto that mountain with James and John and you, you know, that amazing thing happened with the cloud and God's voice was heard. And, and, and who remembers the baptism? Who remembers Jesus' baptism? Do you remember when God's voice was, was heard? And, and that was really the first time, wasn't it, when we thought to ourselves, you know what, this could be the one. Look, look, someone needs to write this story down. And Mark 
lots of people think was the one who said, okay, give, give, give me the evidence. Give me the, the written stuff that you've got. Mary, just make sure I get this right, that story. What, just remind me again exactly what happened. And, and Mark, as he collects the gospel together, Mark is saying, well, okay, I, I'm, I'm just going to stick to the most important things. So I'm not, I'm not going to embellish the story in any way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell this story straight. And, and the reason I think this might be the case, the reason that other people think that in a way Mark almost is like a story that starts in the, at the end and then flashbacks is because of the ending of Mark's gospel. Why don't you open up your, your phones or there's some Bibles on, on either side of me. Let's do a little bit of going into the Bible together. And, and Mark chapter 16, the, the words are going to be on the screen for us, but open up your, your Bibles, open up on your phone, or, or grab one of the paper copies if you want, because it might, might actually even reinforce what I'm about to say and what I'm about to share with you. But here's, here's the end, as most people, most uh, writers and people would think is the end of Mark's story. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, And Salome bought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That can't be true, can it? That's not true. That last line cannot be true. Do you want to stick it up on the screen again? Thanks. Can it be true that they said nothing to anyone? I'm not trying to trick you. Can that be true? How do you know that's not true? Because we're here. That is the answer I was hoping for. You see, the one possibility is that they didn't do what Mark says they first at least thought about doing. And it's interesting, isn't it? Why? Why then... Why then are we here like this now? Maybe you're someone who wouldn't describe yourself as a, as a Christian. You, uh, you know a lot about God. Maybe you've heard stuff about, about Jesus, but you're not sure that you would describe yourself as a Christian. You might bravely describe yourself as an atheist. It takes an enormous amount of faith to be an atheist. I really admire you if you are one. I haven't actually met very many people who turn out to truly be atheists. But good on you if you've got the faith to take that position. Most people I talk to who are not yet Christians are agnostics. They're not sure if this is true or not true. And when I find myself talking to them, and we do this a lot, obviously, when I find myself talking to people about proof for the resurrection, I quite often do get to the point where I say, well, 
I'm here. How do you explain me? Now, there are many ways to describe me. And many people have tried to explain me. But when you try and explain me as a Christian, you have to somehow explain how some women went to a tomb, found it empty, were so frightened and so were bewildered that at, that at first it was a real possibility and probably the case that initially they couldn't even bring themselves to share that news with anybody else. And yet, 2,000 years later, 2,000 miles away at least, here we are. And if you would describe yourself as someone who's not sure about the claims of Jesus, why don't you spend the next 15 minutes of your life thinking about that one? And then I'd love to chat to you. Because you see, I think the only explanation really is that these women experienced the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Because you might also have noticed that as well as the gospel effectively stopping at this point, there's a, there's a little sort of postscript that a later writer has added on to. There's nothing to be fussed about that. It's quite normal in this genre and age of writing. Someone's put a little postscript to try and explain some things. But the only way I think to explain why the Gospel of Mark finishes where we read up to is because the women who were bewildered and frightened then meet the risen Lord Jesus Christ. All the stuff that we read about in some of the other Gospel accounts and we read about in Acts and we read about in the rest of our Bibles. And they, they didn't need Mark to write that stuff down. They didn't need Mark to tell them what they already knew about the Lord Jesus being who he said he is, the Son of God, and that after three days, he did exactly what he said he was going to do, which is he came to life, and he walked around. And They, they didn't need Mark to, to, to remind them about the time that Jesus spoke to them and, and touched them. And, and they didn't need to be, have Mark write down for them to remind them about the times that Jesus ate with them. Stuff, by the way, that ghosts don't do. They didn't need Mark to write down and remind them about the times when Jesus appeared to loads and loads of people. Because they already knew that. Because they were there. They'd experienced it. But what they did want Mark to do was tell them the story of how they got to this point. They wanted to know what had led up to all of that. We quite often have the amazing privilege in this church, don't we, of baptizing people in the, in the pool just behind me here in, in the platform. And time and time again, when we ask people to tell us their, their story, they're telling us about what's led up to this point. We, we don't need them to tell us about what's going on right before our eyes. We can, we can see it. We can see people going down into the water and, and symbolically it's like down into the water away from God. And then they come up, up into the fullness of the new life that God wants every single one of us to enjoy and experience. And the, the smile is on their face. And, and they, don't need, they don't need to tell us about the, the champagne which we drink in this church as our custom. They don't need to tell us about the amazing volume and loudness and pleasure in the music that we sing together. They don't, they don't need to tell us that because we can see it. We can experience it. But what we love hearing is how we got here. We love hearing about the, the first time that they began to dare to believe that Jesus might be God. 
We, we love to hear about the time when someone prayed for them and they, they weren't sure what was going to happen, but what happened was that God filled them, the Holy Spirit, God on the inside, God in our hearts filled them. And we love to hear the stories of tra- change and transformation because it builds up our faith. It encourages us. It helps to explain why we're here. We've been tracking with Mark. You may remember that he's with a real economy of words, he's, he's identified a central single question which anyone tonight would bear to, you know, would be so blessed to just keep focused in their mind, especially if you're someone who wouldn't dare, not yet, to call yourself a Christian. Anyone who kind of wants to jump up at this point and go, Oi, you, git, I want to tell you something about me. I want to say, Oi, I don't believe you. What about... Apologize for the word. The question is, who is Jesus? You you know, don't you, if you were here with us, Mark chapter 1, you could flick back or or thumb back or something. Uh, Right at the beginning, gospel of of chapter 1, verse 1, he writes, the beginning of the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And you'll remember that that, that Mark's described for us and he describes for for the women and the other followers who've then experienced the resurrection. When he's saying, how did we get here? You remember how Jesus healed the sick, and he cast out demons. And and you'll maybe remember that every time he healed someone who was sick, he touched them. And and, and every time he cast out evil, he cast out a a demon, he he cast out evil, he just did it by the authority of his voice. Do you remember that? And do you remember those parables that that he taught and the, and the, the miracles that he performed. He, do you remember when he calmed the storm? Do you remember when he walked on water, when he fed the crowds? And Mark has reminded us about all the times that he came into conflict with the Jewish religious leaders of his day. The ones who were trying to box God up into a religious little framework, a religious little package. I, I meet so many people who've had just enough religion to put them off God. When I, you know, sometimes people, when they find out what I do for a living, job, calling, something, they say, oh, I'm not religious. I say, oh, please, God, I hope I'm not either. And and Mark says, Mark has written for us and said, do you remember those run-ins he had with them? And Jesus was was trying to remind them about the the purpose that they had, the reason that God had called them to be his people, the way that God had said, I want you to be the ones that share the good news. I want you to be the ones that, that say, God is into the restoration business, that God takes people who know they're not good enough. God takes people who who know that they've messed up, who know that they've failed. God takes people who use unfortunate words when they're preaching and he forgives them and he loves them completely and perfectly. And you, my people, have this job to go and tell everybody about it. Do you remember the run-ins that Jesus had with those leaders because they couldn't take it. They wanted to keep this amazing good news. The good news of God's love. And they wanted to keep it for themselves. And then and then Peter, do you remember? Yeah. 
Do you remember, Peter, you were the one. Do you remember we were walking and Jesus said, who, who do the crowds say that I am? And do you remember you, we answered, didn't we, first? Because we didn't know whether Jesus was trying to catch us out a little bit. We weren't quite sure. I was, I was scared what to say. But, but, but you, Peter, I remember you said, well, some of them say you're Elijah. And then, and then Peter, do you remember when Jesus looked at you? It, it's it's going to be back in chapter 8, by the way, of my new volume. Do you remember when... Jesus looked at you and said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, you, you, you did it. You were the one who was brave enough to say, you are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. And then Mark writes for us and says, Remember when we then turned towards Jerusalem, that's the, the turning point, isn't it? We, we then decisively turned towards Jerusalem and the rest of the story was us following Jesus towards Jerusalem and, and towards the cross. He, he kept on warning us. Do you remember? He kept on telling us exactly what was going to happen. He kept on saying that he was going to be crucified. And we, we kept on trying to say, no, that isn't the, that's not the story that we're expecting. That's not what we think God is going to do. We're expecting you somehow to, to rise up in your mighty power. But you, he told us, do you remember how he told us that he was going to die? He was going to be crucified. Yeah, they were going to do what it says in the Old Testament. Another little thing, if you're thinking about becoming a follower of Jesus, the number of promises made in the Old Testament that are fulfilled in the life of Jesus. In the Old Testament, he's going to fulfill those words where it says people will whip him and they will spit at him. And they will strip him naked and they will stick him on a cross. And they will kill, they will kill me. He told us that. Ah, oh, we're remembering now. We're remembering now, aren't we? Now that we're here, we're remembering what he told us. The truth of what he told us. And we remember that last meal. Do you remember that last meal we had, says, says Mark? He, he's written it down for them. Not everyone could be there, so let me tell you what happened. We were there with Jesus. It was the Passover meal. The significance, the symbolism of that did not escape us, or it certainly doesn't now. And do you remember when he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this will remind you of my body? And then do you remember when he took the cup of wine? Some of, some of you weren't there, but this is what happened. He took the cup of wine. It was a ceremonial cup of wine. It had significance. And he took it and he sipped and he said, this will remind you of my blood. That's, that's what happened. If you want to explain how we got here, if you want to understand how Jesus can be alive and how he can be moving around us and we could touch him and we could eat, and if you want to understand how God has put into Jesus all of his love and poured it out into the world and poured it out into us, you need to remember this. This is how we got here. But we can't skip over the bit, can we, where Judas betrayed him. I don't know, did you, did you see that coming? I, I didn't see that coming. Did you expect it? I mean, I remember, we've remembered, I've written it down, haven't I? I remember one of you reminded me that Jesus warned us that that's what was going to happen. I, again, it's in the Old Testament scripture, isn't it? We'd forgotten, but it's there. Jesus reminded us, didn't he? Did you see it coming? Did you see it being Judas? I, I didn't. And then he was crucified. And Mark says, there you are. You want to know how we get here? You want to know how it's possible that 2,000 years later, more than 2,000 miles away, we could be here? It's because the answer to my question about the identity of Jesus is that. He's the son of God. And he rose again. He is the resurrected one. The proof 
is in the empty tomb. And do you know, do you remember what Jesus told us? That the same power that was going to enable that to happen was now going to fill us. And, and that's how we can explain what's going on. That's how we can explain that, I mean, look at us. Look at us. You wouldn't start a revolution, would you, with us? I mean, I'm too short and hairy. You wouldn't, you know, I'm not a gladiator. Thank you. But I mean, look at us. You wouldn't, you wouldn't do this revolution, transformation of the world with us, would you? Sorry, friends. But it is what's happening. It is what's happening. You see, people keep getting baptised in this pool. And it's not because it's the only water supply left in Cheltenham. And people keep standing on, uh, in this church and, and keep saying, this is what God has done. This is the transforming power of God. I had a picture before I started um, speaking tonight, and it was that there are some people here where you feel this bit of your life in this exact moment is about kind of like this size. And what I don't understand as I'm speaking to you, and maybe even God doesn't understand, is out through that door, if you kind of went in a slurp, there would be this giant bubble of stuff. Those relationships, those financial issues, that stuff that's going on at work, that, that, that way that you think about yourself, the, the kind of whole, what, what's the rest of my life about kind of stuff, or if you're at the other end of it, the whole of what has my life been about. That's this big bubble out there, and Andrew, you don't understand that you're just talking to me in this little space here, but it's all of that that I'm really bothered about. And I felt God saying to me, Andrew, tell them tonight that the power of resurrection, the same power that took Jesus from a tomb to being alive again is the power that is in us. This is why you're here. This is why we are here. That stuff is not greater, is not greater than the power of God. The transforming, healing, restorative power of God. So that person who just thought, but you don't really know what I'm like, you wouldn't love me if you really know what I was like, not true. God knows you perfectly, and he still died on a cross for you. Hey, friends, how many times have I looked in the mirror and reminded myself of that? Those women were scared that they wouldn't be able to move a stone away from a tomb. Those women were, were scared. The men were not even, they were so scared they didn't even turn up, so I... You know, pecking order, the women far in advance. But they were scared that there was going to be a stone that they couldn't move. They were scared that there were going to be Roman soldiers who they wouldn't be able to get past. They were scared that there was going to be a slightly moldy body that they had to deal with. They were scared of this whole big sloop pool of stuff. And their faith felt like this small, like in here. But the stone had already been rolled away. The Roman soldiers had already been taken away. Their fears were unfounded. And how God honours their steps of courage. I say the men were so frightened of their fears, they didn't even dare to take the steps of courage. These women take hesitant steps. 
and how God blesses them. Do you have fears tonight that are totally, actually, in reality, unfounded? I mean, I know they feel like a giant big stone. I know they feel like the two best Roman soldiers you could ever imagine. I realize that. I'm not saying you're being foolish to recognize how big and how strong and how significant they are from a worldly perspective. But our perspective is not a worldly perspective. In the perspective of God, even things that really are giant big stones, even things that are really strapping great big Roman soldiers, even things that really are like that, cancer, broken marriage, porn addiction, So much debt, you don't dare dare tell anybody about it. Fear that you'll never be loved fully. Things that are real in our worldly mind in comparison to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ can be like nothing at all. Because the same power, not a lower form of, not a a little bit of, the same resurrection power that took Jesus from the grave into new life is his gift to us. And we know it works. Because otherwise we wouldn't be reading a story that tells us that no one was going to pass it on. Something changed. That's why we're here. Just want to let that sink in for one moment. I, I just know that God wants to do some stuff tonight. I, I know that. Someone else had the picture. I had this picture of a little bit of world in here. And Andrew, you think we're only focused on this and there's all that stuff. And God wanting to say, swap them over. Someone else had the picture of a chiropractor and a manipulation of the spine or some other bit of the body and the crack. The crack. That has to happen for it all to change. Two two final things I want to say. And I, I, yeah, I'm hoping the Holy Spirit's caused me to put power where I needed to put power in my voice, (laughs) etc. Um. The first is, and this is maybe for those of us who've been on the journey for a little bit longer. The reality of the situation for the disciples, the women, who who are presented with Mark's gospel to help them understand and explain how they got here. The reality for them was to walk the way of Jesus. Jesus. It might sound a really obvious thing to say, but the whole way through Mark, he's been asking this question, hasn't he, about identity. Who is identity? He's the risen king. But he's the risen king who knelt down and washed people's feet. He's the risen king who was nailed to a cross. 
So the fact of the restorative, life-giving power of God, the Holy Spirit in us, means that actually we walk the way of Jesus, not walk a different way. And I wonder if there's anyone here who's disappointed with God in the sense that you think, God, I'm, I'm doubting your power because look at my life. And I just really want to gently, because I can't, I can't share your life. I have an incredibly privileged life. But I just want to ask, I want to ask you if you think you're asking the right question. Because can I tell you, being spat at, being hobbled by a cross, uh, being abused and those things are not actually a sign that God's power is not available to you. When Bishop Ernest comes to speak to us from Caricho, he will come to speak to us of people who have faith in circumstances that lots of us in this room would say, well, clearly God's not blessing me at the moment because I don't have. Never hear that. You'll never, if you go to Kenya on one of our trips, you'll never hear that. You'll hear them giving thanks. Do you remember when Holly, some of us were here, and Holly was speaking, she told the story of the woman who had walked, and it is sadly women, and massive big story there. The woman who's walked for several hours to get the water, and she pours it out abundantly. She doesn't say, God doesn't exist, resurrection power's not really true, because I don't have a tap. Doesn't say that, does she? Says, thank you, God, that I've got water to give to Holly. So I want, I want to encourage us to have the highest understanding and sense of God's power. But don't think that God's power equals make my life easy. And the final thing is, is that the, the young men did have an instruction for the women, didn't they? You notice, by the way, they were looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, human. And they, he, they actually answered, the risen one. There's a lot of people looking for human Jesus when he's actually risen Jesus. But the instruction, verse 7, go and tell. We're here because people went and told. If you're able to, shall we stand? So it is my sense that God wants to do some, some significant stuff in us. It is my sense that God the Holy Spirit, God with us, God on the inside, wants to do some of his inside-out work in us. Some of his transforming A word, a word I would love to banish from my own vocabulary because I just say it so stupidly about myself the whole time is the word just. I just. I'm just. I wonder if there's a few other justs in the room. A few other people in the room, you're, you're actually going along with the idea that you're less worthy, less loved, less special, less desired by God. And you might be going along with that because of the size of the stone and the, the Roman soldiers that are in that big pool outside of this room. Well, can I just now pray? Can I pray for you, please? And maybe would you allow yourself to receive whatever God wants to give you? Not, not what I have on offer, but, but God. 
if you find it helpful, it's, it's not magic, but it's just an outward sign of, of an inward desire to just open a hand and just say, love of God, come. Holy Spirit, God, God here. Love of God, come. Love of God, would you just come and wash into some hearts and lives? How did we get here, God? We got here because of you. How did we get here? We got here because Jesus Christ, Son of God, Messiah, lived and walked. Jesus Christ, Son of God, died on a cross for each one of us. And the blood of Jesus washes away every barrier. That's why we're here. So come, God. Holy Spirit, come, God. Anyone who has that word just kind of over their picture or over the mirror as they look at themselves, would you take it away? Take it away. Would you come, Holy Spirit? Pour your love. Pour your love. Pour your love. Pour your love. And for those who've been looking for proof, for those who've been looking for proof, thank you, God, that that's not a foolish thing to want. It's not stupid and foolish to want to know that this is real, that you're real. But would you now open the eyes of our hearts to see you, to see your resurrected self. Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you be proof now? If there's a warming sensation in your heart, if there's a, you can just hear almost the word yes. It's just like something has clicked. Holy Spirit, come. For anyone who's been wondering about following you, wondering about saying yes, let them hear your yes. Spirit, yes. 